All right, Matthew for Beginners, um, lesson number 12, Rejection and Judgment. And we're going to be going through discourse number five. And if you're following along in your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 23. This is probably one of the most complex passages, uh, certainly among the gospel or even in the, in the Bible that we're going to tackle tonight. So you need to uh, stay with me, okay? Stay with me. So in narrative number five, Matthew describes the various encounters that Jesus has with people on His way from Galilee in the north down to Jerusalem in the south. That's what he's talking about. In most of these meetings, and especially with the religious leaders, we've seen that Jesus uh, finds a lack of faith, a hardness of hearts. You know, he's, he's not having the popularity that he had at the very beginning of his ministry. The poor people, the, those who are helpless, they're eager to make him king, but these very same people would abandon him and even demand his crucifixion a little bit later on. The leaders, however, the Jewish leaders and the priests, they were openly hostile and they rejected his teaching, his claims, despite the fact that what he had done was all according to scripture and even they plotted to take his life even though he was innocent of any, of any crime. So in discourse number five, Matthew records Jesus' response to this overall rejection by those to whom he had been sent. Remember, the plan has been for thousands of years, you know, God is preparing the Jewish people in all a variety of ways to, to, for this moment when the Messiah would come. And when he does come, they reject him and of course uh, put him to death. So Jesus is now going to respond to that overall rejection, okay, in chapter 23. So Jesus' main protagonists were the Pharisees. They hated him, they wanted to kill him because he posed such a threat to their position, first and foremost. And he, he called them, right? He called them hypocrites, you know, so they, they, there was no love lost there. In, the pas in this passage that we're going to look at, Jesus reveals uh, the Pharisees for what they really are and He warns the people not to emulate them and for good reason. So all of this is a lead up to the big, you know, the judgment that He will make. So let's read verses one to four. I don't usually read all the passages, but here we're going to read a couple, okay? 23, He says, Then Jesus spoke to the crowd and, said, and His disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore all that they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. Now to put themselves in Moses' position of authority, meaning they were claiming authority from God for the things that they commanded. Uh, the Pharisees were doing this. They burdened people with the yoke of the law. How was it a yoke? Well, they burdened people with the yoke of the law without reference to grace or faith, which was also promised in the law. Just the law without reference to grace or faith. But they themselves did not try to lighten the load with grace or faith, either teaching it or emulating it. They only piled on to other people more and more demands of law keeping which they themselves did not try to keep in good conscience. And Jesus knew this and He calls them on it. Then in verse five to seven, He says, but they do all the deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their uh, uh, phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greeting in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. So what they're doing, Jesus says, is based on pride and the love of honor from, from men. The motivation for their religious practice was evil. God, you know, he, he sees not just the act, but He sees the motivation. And He's saying to them, you may look religious with your long prayers and your religious gowns and all that kind of stuff, but you're only practicing your religion out of pride because you want you know, the respect of men, the applaud, the approval of, of people. And so in uh, verses eight to 20, I'm not going to read though, Jesus 
ends this passage by exhorting his disciples not to emulate the Pharisees who try to lord over others in religious authority without support from God or the scriptures. That was the, that was the worst thing. They were lording over people and they didn't even have the authority to do so from scriptures and the Lord hadn't given them that right, but they did it anyways. So he's, this is you know, where he's saying, don't be called rabbi. You know, don't be called rabbi by anyone. He tells them that in the sense that the Pharisees had with self-appointed authority to speak where God had not. So Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't call yourself a rabbi and then speak for God where God has not spoken. He didn't mean, don't anyone call themselves a rabbi. I mean, even people were calling him rabbi. It's just a term, teacher. But don't be called rabbi in the sense that they were being called rabbi. Okay? Uh, don't be called my father. I remember people say, oh, that means we can't use the term father anymore. Well, of course not. You know, don't be called my father, again, in the same sense that one had unquestioned authority and lordship over another believer. No one has that authority other than Christ. And don't become a leader, he says, as the Pharisees had become, leaders who gave no honor to Christ. Now, these are teachers and elders and leadership in the church, I mean, there is leadership in the church, Jesus isn't saying there shouldn't be any leadership. What he's saying is the leadership that exists shouldn't be like these leaders, shouldn't be hypocrites like, like these leaders, okay? So those who are like this are raised up in the kingdom by the power and the authority of Christ to greater and greater service and leadership. And those who, like the Pharisees, exalt themselves will ultimately be rejected. And so Jesus warns his disciples, you, know, you can be leaders, but don't be like these guys because there'll be punishment. And so he follows up this, this kind of pointing out of them with what, what, what is called the eight woes, the eight woes in chapter 23. And if you look at your, you know, your outline where I've, I've, I've outlined the various activities that take place you know, in sections two, three, and four in the outline, you'll notice that Jesus' discourse follows the style and pattern of the Old Testament prophets. When the prophets, if you were to study the Old Testament prophets, and if you were to make an outline you know, of their prophecies and of their warnings and of their, uh, of their speeches to the people, you would notice that there is a certain pattern in the way that they put their material together. First of all, there was a warning. You better be careful, you're doing what's wrong, you know, and so on and so forth. Secondly, there would be a lament. The prophet would be sorrowful because of the terrible punishment that was coming on the people. Third part, there would be a prophecy of judgment. The prophets would say, okay, if you don't repent, this is what's going to happen. And then finally, many times, there was either a call to repent or a promise that God would restore them if they did repent. And so if you look at you know, the, the various minor prophets, major prophets, a lot of their discourses follow this kind of outline. Warning, lament, prophecy of judgment, and then a call to repentance. Now, in the Old Testament, the prophets preached in this particular format. And so Jesus, now speaking to Jews, who would be quite familiar with this format and language from their study of the prophets, now Jesus borrows this type of outline, okay? Uh, warning, lament, prophecy of judgment. He borrows this outline and he couches his terms according to the Old Testament style of prophecy. So he begins with the woes on the Pharisees who typified the worst of that society in their religious hypocrisy and refusal to believe in them. So he does woes, to a woe on you. And he, there are eight woes. We don't have time to read them all. I'll just summarize them for you. So woe on you for disbelieving and causing others to disbelieve while all the while pretending to believe. Verse 13, woe on you for using religion to mask your greed. Number three, woe. Uh, for blasphemy and using God's name and making vows without considering God Himself, verses 16 to 22. Uh, let's see, verse five, there we go. Number five, it'll come, here we go, thank you. Uh, woe for majoring in minors. In other words, making the small points of the law the most important in order to avoid doing what the law actually says they should do in regards to justice and mercy. Woe number six. 
Woe to false rituals and all kinds of hand washing rituals and so on and so forth that they were burdening people with which were not even required by the law. Woe to hypocrites, speaks for itself. And then woe to those who shed innocent blood. He tells them, your ancestors are the ones that killed the prophets. You're guilty. All their blood is, is going to be on your head. So Jesus finishes you know, with a stinging condemnation of the Pharisees and those like them upon whom he says will come the punishment for all of these sins. Okay, so you notice the outline. There's the warning. Remember I said the prophets, there was a warning, a lament, so on and so forth. So there's the warning, woe to you. Now there's the lament part. Jesus laments over Jerusalem and her people, right? What does He say in, um, in Matthew 37? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate, for I say to you from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So there, there's Jesus' lament. Okay, he warns them and then he tells them how his heart is breaking because they're not wanting to respond. He mourns the fact that they have and will ultimately reject him. He yearns that they would have come to him and that he might spare them the terrible judgment that awaits them. He declares them desolate and he shakes his robe and stamps his sandals to shake off their dust from his feet as those who have not received him. And then in verse 39 he tells the Jews, those who are listening anyways, that from this moment on he will no longer appear to those who reject him. In other words, for the Jews, only those who re, uh, uh, recognize Him as Messiah will see Him in the sense of they will see and understand who He is by faith. Uh, there's only one sign left, He says, and that's the sign of Jonah left for them. And if they believe, they will see Him again. If not, they will see judgment, which He explains in the next section. So warning, right? Woe to you, you know. Lament, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wanted to take you under my wings, okay? Okay, now comes the judgment, the judgment part, verses 24 and 25. So what's happening, he's made the warning and, 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 the, and the lament, and as they leave the temple area, um, and uh, he leaves with his apostles, they begin to point out the magnificent buildings of the temple, which he has just said will be deserted. Now, interestingly, uh, Herod had, uh, you know, he was a builder, he loved to build, and the reconstruction process of the temple had been going on for over 40 years. It was always under construction. And so when Jesus said, you see these, they're all, they're not one stone's going to be left on another, so they are a little confused because for 40 years now, this thing is being built, so we read, in verse one and two of chapter 24, now we head into the judgment, okay? Stay with me. The, 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 the warning, the lament, now the judgment part. He says, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when His disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to Him. And He said to them, do you not see these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. So Jesus responds to their comment by saying that the buildings will not only be empty, remember he says in the lament, I'm leaving your house empty. He says not only will the place be empty, but it'll be completely torn down. And so this sets up further questions by the disciples, Peter and uh, James and John and Andrew, um, because they wanted more information about what he had just said. You know, they question him uh, about these things. So we read verses three, uh, verse three. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Isn't it interesting that Peter and James and John and Andrew, they're the ones who ask the question, they're curious about this stuff. And notice that in the Bible that it's Peter and John who write about the end of the world later on. Okay. 
And so they ask him two questions. When uh, will the destruction of the temple be? Because he said not one of these stones will be left standing. So when's that going to happen, they ask, number one. And number two, what signs will accompany the second coming and the end of the world which the second coming will bring? Now, whether they thought that both these events would happen at the same time or with a lapse of time, we don't know. They didn't know and they were asking Jesus to instruct them in these matters. So again, they asked two questions. One, when will the buildings be destroyed? And two, what are the signs of your coming? What are the signs of your uh, return? So the next section that we're going to look at is very complex but it can be divided into three major periods. And if you understand the three major periods, you'll be able to understand this complicated passage here. So first, let's look at the three. Jesus is going to talk about three different times in the next verses. The first is a period of time from about when they are, you know, when he's there with his apostles, around 37 AD, something like that, and they're asking him questions all the way to the end of time when he comes back. So the one section uh, where Jesus is talking to them will involve from the present, you know, around 37 AD, to the end of time. That's, that's the big section. Then he's going to talk to them, he's going to telescope in on a particular time in history, and that's 70 AD. So after the panoramic view, he's going to telescope in and talk to them about what's going to happen in 70 AD. He doesn't say 70 AD, but we know it's 70 AD because of what happened. And then he's going to back up again, and the third thing he's going to talk to them about, he's going to telescope in to the end of the world when he returns. So if you're understanding that he's going to talk about three time periods, it'll make, this passage will make a lot more sense. Okay, so panorama of world history until the second coming, telescope to the events leading up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and then thirdly, telescope to the second coming at the end of the world. So let's start with the panorama until the second coming. Panorama view, verse four. And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. So the instructions are given so that they will know and avoid false teaching and prophets in these matters. Isn't it interesting that there are so many wild speculative ideas and theories about this passage, okay? And the very first thing that Jesus warns them at the very beginning is be careful that no one misleads you. Okay, verses five to eight. He says, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you're not frightened for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. And so the cycle of false prophets, wars, troubles in the world are going to continue until the very end of time, but these things in themselves are not the signs. They are only the beginning of things which will get progressively worse before not only the end of Jerusalem comes, but also the end of the world comes. So should we be surprised that there's war? Well, of course not. Jesus said there's going to be war. Are we, are we, do we lose heart because there's a tornado or there's a flood or a tsunami or there's an earthquake where a thousand or 10,000 people get killed? Well, no, he just said it here. There'll be famines, there'll be earth, there'll be all kinds of things going on. Don't look to these things to try to decide when the end of the world comes. Now, it's easy for us sitting in a dry room but if this building is under 20 feet of water and there's a huge earthquake and half of our homes have been destroyed, you might start thinking, well, maybe this is the end of the world, okay? He says, don't, don't do that. Verse nine to 12, he says, 
then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. So here he's making a parallel to what Paul will eventually write in 2 Thessalonians where Paul talks about the end of the world and what has to take place first. And I'm sorry, I have to kind of go over to 2 Thessalonians. Maybe some of you were not in that class, but in 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Paul talks about the end of the world. You know, people were worried, the Thessalonians were worried about the end of the world, and he tells them, don't worry about the end of the world. Before that happens, other things have to happen first. For example, there has to be an apostasy. In other words, a falling away from the faith. Secondly, the man of lawlessness has to be revealed. So he tells them, you know, before the end of the world comes, there's going to be some specific signs that Christians will notice. And what's going to happen is a, de a devolution. You know, we talk about evolution. Jesus doesn't talk about the future in terms of evolution. He talks about the future in terms of devolution. There's a fall. It begins with a theological fall. People stop believing in God. And then there's a philosophical fall. Philosophical fall is, is once there's a falling from theology, then people start making up their own ideas as to how the world came to be and what the world is about and what life is about. So there's a philosophical fall. We get, we get darkened in our ideas. Once there's a philosophical fall, then a moral fall follows right after. The, the, the breakdown of the family, the breakdown of moral customs and so on and so forth. Once that happens, then you know, we, we go down into civil strife and war and so on and so forth. And if you study a panoramic of history, you'll see that the world has been devoluting in this way, in this cycle over and over again throughout history. And usually when it gets to the bottom of the cycle, there's usually a revival that, that brings back. There's a, a, a calling out to God, a revival. A lot of people think the Protestant Re Reformation was a kind of a revival to go back to God and back to the Bible and search for the true God. So Jesus is saying here, there's going to be a devolution, a cycle of what's going to take place throughout history until the end. And my own opinion is we'll probably be at the bottom of that cycle and instead of having a revival to kind of bring us back up, Jesus will return. It'll get so bad, the man of lawlessness will be revealed, the world will really be in trouble and Jesus will return to save us. Okay, so he talks about the devolution. Let's now remember, we're still looking at the panoramic view. He's still talking to his apostles about what's going to take place between the time they're talking and the end of the world. So in verse 13 he says, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Notice, it's not the one who figures out when Jesus is returning that'll be saved, it's the one who stays faithful to the end who will be saved, okay? So in contrast, he promises that the faithful will be saved despite all these trials, despite all this evil. Verse 14, he says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. He also promises that the great commission will be carried out and must be carried out before the end can and will come. All right, so there is the panoramic view of the events and the flow of history that will occur until His second coming. A devolution, okay, theological, philosophical, moral, you know, round and round we go, all the way to the end, wars, famines, uh, rumors of wars, all these things, uh, the, the gospel be preached throughout the world, that has to happen first, okay? All right, in verse 15 he shifts gears and he telescopes to one specific year in particular, and that is the fall of Jerusalem, okay? Now Judea was rebellious and longed to return to the glory days of independence and power at the time of Solomon. So in the early 60s, not the 1960s, in the early 60s, 60 AD, they had such unrest that Rome sent troops in to quell the rebellion. From 66 to 70 AD, the Roman army successfully laid siege to Jerusalem and they totally destroyed the city and the temple with over a million people. 
This total destruction of the Jewish nation was, for, was the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy to the disciples some 30 years earlier that are described in this passage here. The disciples wanted to know when this would happen, and so Jesus gives them the signs to watch out for. They want to know when, when, is the, when is the, you know when he said not one stone will be left, one on top of another, this building will be destroyed. When he says that, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And they want to know when is this going to happen? And are there signs that point to this? Okay? And his answer is yes, there are signs that will point to this. There are, no, there are no signs that you don't know when the end of the world is going to be, but you will know when the destruction of Jerusalem is, uh, is coming, all right? So verse 15 to 18, he gives the signs. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are, that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. So they say, what are the signs of that destruction? And he says, the first sign is going to be the abomination of desolation. The point was that when the temple would be desecrated, this would be a sign that destruction was near and they should escape the city. So he makes reference to Daniel, you know, let the reader understand. Well, the Jew who was reading understood that the reference was from Daniel chapter 13, uh, chapter 11 and chapter 12, because Daniel had prophesied that the temple would be defiled and it was in the days of the Maccabees by the Syrian king Epiphanes who sacrificed a pig on the altar of the temple. Now I don't mean to confuse you. He's saying one of the signs that the destruction is coming is, is that the temple will be desecrated. Okay? And then let the reader understand. Well, the reader understood that that had happened before. That, that the desecration of the temple had taken place once before in history, some several hundred years before Jesus came. Okay? And the person who did that was a northern king, a Syrian king, Epiphanes, and he wanted to destroy the Jewish religion, so on and so forth, so he, he did a lot of things, but he sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple and he knew that that would desecrate the temple. So what Jesus is saying is, when you see something like that happen, know that the end is very near. Okay, so Jesus picks up this idea of desecration and he says that in the same way when the temple will be defiled by Gentiles during their lifetime, it'll be a sign to escape. Now, in Luke chapter 21 verse 20, Luke tells us that the surrounding of the temple by foreign armies is what constituted the defilement of the temple. And the reason for that is that the Romans had standards, right? They had shields where the different companies would gather around. And on those shields, on those standards, they had uh, various idols. And many of them would actually worship these, uh, these idols. They were the center of worship. So when the temple was surrounded by idolatrous images, this, Jesus is saying, this is what, well, Luke is saying, this is what constitutes the defilement of the temple. Now there's, there's a lot of scholars who kind of differ here as to what the abomination was and they refer to all kinds of Jewish historians and so on. It's a lot of theories, but here's the point. There's only one scripture reference in Luke that describes what the defilement is going to be. So I'm, go always, I'm always going to go with the scripture reference over the historical reference. Luke has told us this is what constitutes the defilement of the temple, so we know. So then he says, he who reads means he who reads Daniel and along with Christ's cryptogram will be able to know when it's time to get out, and many did. We know from history that in 68 AD, the majority of Christians who were living in Jerusalem escaped to a city called Pella, thus avoiding being killed in the massacre that took place in the following 18 months. All right, 19. He says, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor will ever be. 
So the tribulation he's talking about is the suffering caused by the Roman army which wiped out the nation. Remember, this wasn't like uh, in the movies. They, you know, they surround the thing and then you hear someone say, attack, you know, and there's a big battle. No, 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 no. They didn't, want, they didn't want to take their life in their hands by trying to charge the city. They just surrounded the city and cut them off. They had no food. They had no food, they had no water, they had nothing. And they just waited them out. And over a period of almost two years, people starved to death, there was cannibalism, it was horrible. People were killing each other. And once, once they were too weak to resist, the, the Roman armies just went in and then just wiped them all out destroyed everything, stole all the valuable stuff, and they also destroyed the genealogical records that were stored in the temple, which meant that no Jew could now trace their family lineage according to the genealogical records, which means that they couldn't reestablish any priesthood. So when we say it destroyed their religion, we're not kidding. Their religion basically was destroyed at that time. So the combination of the gravity of the sin, you know, the Jews who received all the blessings for thousands of years and all the promises and then ended up killing their Messiah. So the combination of the gravity of that sin and the horror of the punishment, their, their nation was wiped out. The writer says here, this has not been equaled in history. This has never happened before. Okay. In verse 22, it says, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the safe of, sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So God's providence permitted this war to end so that the Christians would not also be annihilated along with the Jews. Remember, the city was destroyed. The Romans, they didn't make a difference between Jews and Jewish Christians. To them, Jew was a Jew, they just wiped them all out. Okay? That was the point. In verse 23, it says, then if anyone says to you, behold, he is, uh, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arrive and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out, or behold, he is in the inner rooms, uh, uh, do, not, uh, do not believe them. So the believers, would naturally associate the destruction of Jerusalem with the return of Jesus, okay? They're thinking, remember I told you about prophecy? We know the order of things, but we don't know the distance between events. So Christians at that time would think, whoa, this is like the end of the world, so I guess Jesus is coming in 70 AD, right? So in order to avoid this, this misconception, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, gives them a warning, okay? He warns them against being deceived by those who would claim to be the Lord or speak from God. Now, Josephus, a Jewish historian of the time, documents during this period how during this time rumors of the Messiah coming or being present circulated in order to keep people inside the city, okay? In those days, hysteria and fear produced many prophets who claimed visions or messages from God. One false prophet said that he would separate the Sea of Galilee and 25,000 people followed him out there, but you know, he, didn't, he couldn't do it, he couldn't do it. So in verse 27, verse 27, he says, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what does he say? Don't believe them if, you know, 70 AD, don't believe them with all this chaos and all this massacre going on, don't believe them when they say, oh, the Lord is here, the Lord is coming, don't believe them. He says to them that when He does return, it will be evident to everyone, just like lightning across the sky, everyone will easily and readily know that it's Him. You won't have to guess at it, there won't be any debate, you know, when Jesus returns, everybody will know that He returns, that's what that that saying there, the lightning, you know, just as the lightning comes from the east and so on and so forth. In verse 28 he says, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. The corpse, remember, he's still talking about 70 AD. The corpse is the Jewish nation. The vultures are the false Christs and the false prophets. He says to them, when you see these in abundance, these will be a second sign that the end of Jerusalem is near. Not the end of the world is near, the end of Jerusalem is near. Verse 29, 
But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of uh, the heavens will be shaken. So the first word in this verse presents a problem to some people. It says immediately. If we make this next section a discussion about the end of the world and of the second coming of Jesus, then it must occur right after the destruction of Jerusalem because he says here, but immediately after the tribulation, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. See what I'm saying? And actually, there are some, even in our brotherhood, who teach this idea. It's called the 70 AD theory. They teach the idea that Jesus returned in 70 AD, but Jesus is saying, be careful now. Be careful, just because if you see all of this doesn't mean that I've come. Since the man of lawlessness has not been revealed, Jesus has not returned. Therefore, this passage must still be talking about the events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem, 3031. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So 29 to 31, let me read one more verse here. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. So 29 to 31 speaks about the destruction and the effects that this is going to have on other people and believers. The language he uses here is what's called apocalyptic language and is used by prophets to describe cataclysmic historical and political events. You know, in Isaiah chapter 13, Isaiah describes the destruction of Babylon in the same way. Babylon was a nation, but he describes the destruction of Babylon, uh, you know, the moon full of blood, the stars falling out of the sky. These were uh, ways that they spoke um, uh, you know, uh, apocalyptic way, uh, apocalyptic language to describe the fall of nations. Language using the symbolism of the destruction of the heavenly bodies is used to describe very real uh, fate of the world at the end, but also uh, the destruction of nations on the earth. In this case, it's the end of the Jewish nation as a people under God's special care. So when he says the coming of the Son of Man, this refers to both the second coming at the end of the world and also the final judgment, but it also means any judgment that God makes on a particular nation. And that's the confusion people have. So when you see the coming of the Son of Man, it could mean the coming of Jesus at the end of the world, but it can also mean God exercising His judgment on a particular nation. In this case, it's God exercising His judgment on the nation of Israel, because it's got to fit the context of the passage. The Jews who rejected him will now see him coming as a form of judgment on their nation, a terrible catastrophe that would horrify the world, but liberate Christians and the gospel from Jewish persecution and, um, and um, uh, as an obstacle. Now he's, he talks about uh, angels here, his angels with great trumpet, the Greek word translated angel can also be translated messengers. This verse can be seen as prophecy concerning the spreading of the gospel throughout the world after the fall of Jerusalem. And that's what he's saying here. Once Jerusalem falls, he's going to send out the angels, the messengers, the preachers, the missionaries to begin preaching the gospel in earnest. In verse 14 it said that this needed to be done before Christ's return, and now with the ideological and cultural restraints of Judaism removed, Christianity is going to flourish, and we see this historically. I won't read 32 to 35, but here Jesus warns them to pay attention to the signs He's given them because they will happen in their generation, and He promises by His word that they will happen. So all of this that we've just talked about, destruction of Jerusalem, 70 AD. Okay, one last thing. I may go over a bit. I told you it was a difficult passage. All right, so he backs up from 70 AD, and now his next comments, he's going to focus in on the end of the world, verses 36 to 44. So he's just explained to them the signs that will preview the destruction of Jerusalem. One, the preaching of the gospel to all nations. Two, the multiplication of false Christs. 
three, the abomination of the temple, and four, a great tribulation. And all those things took place in 70 AD. So now in 36 to 44, he makes a contrast with the second coming at the end of the world. Verse 36. He says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So he's, he's changed, right? He's just told them about 70 AD, watch for these signs, but now he says, of that day, meaning the end of the world, nobody knows, just the Father knows. 37, he says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Okay. So nobody knows the time, not even Jesus while He's with His disciples. There will be no cataclysmic signs. Everything will be normal. See the difference? For 70 AD, there are signs. For the end of the world, no signs. Normal in the sense that the believers will be preparing themselves for the second coming and the end of the world and the rest of the world will be ignoring it until it will be too late, just like the flood. Verse 40 to 41. Then there will be two men in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. Now some people take this verse to mean that before Jesus returns there's going to be some sort of rapture and people are going to kind of disappear to be with God in heaven. And this is part of the premillennialist view of the rapture and the thousand year reigns. They make movies about it. A guy's driving you know, along and all of a sudden there's nobody in the car and the car is going by itself. That's what they're talking about. This passage right here, the rapture. All of a sudden they'll be taken up. In context, however, Jesus is talking about readiness and he says that when he returns suddenly, one will be saved and one will be lost there'll be no time for repentance. There'll be no time for, oh, wait a minute, let me, let me make the confession of faith now. Oh, is it time for me to be baptized now? That's what he's saying. Just like Noah, when the rain came, they were taken, they disappeared, so to speak, into the ark, and the others remained to die in the flood. When Jesus comes, the faithful will be taken up to be with Him, and the disbelievers immediately put away from His presence. And all this happens how? in the twinkling of an eye. Not, not over a thousand calendar years, in the twinkling of an eye. That's why one will be left. Left to what? Left to judgment. And one will be taken to what? To the reward. So verse 42 to 44, I won't read, don't have time. But he says, since the end is to be like this, we should always be prepared and not foolishly lapse into sin, thinking we have plenty of time to repent and be ready for the return. You never know. So in the final section, please let me finish this. He says, after responding to the question of the judgment on Jerusalem and His return, Jesus warns them to be vigilant and He does so with four parables. I'm not going to read the parables, but I just want to show you where it fits into the section. So He says, you don't know when I'm coming. One will be taken, one will be, one will be left. Right? You don't know when I'm coming, so be ready. And in order to kind of underscore the idea of be ready, he gives four parables. One, the parable of the evil slave, right? Here the lesson is not to presume that we have luxury of sinning because the end is far away. It can come at any time and the judgment is sure for those who are unfaithful. Then there's the parable of the ten virgins. Here Jesus warns against the foolishness of, being, of not being ready. It isn't a question of being evil, but rather negligence. To neglect Christ will bring destruction. Uh, the third parable is the parable of the talents. Here the warning is for those who are in the kingdom but who fail to expand its borders and fail to serve the king with zeal. The slave was not caught or surprised unprepared. He just assumed that his preparation was sufficient. You know, he buried his talent into the ground. He said, good enough, it's good enough. All of three parables have the element of preparation, judgment, and punishment for those who neglect to prepare for the return of the master. And then you have the final parable, and that, not parable, the final scene at the end. You know, I've done all of this tonight because it all fits together in one piece. You know, the warning, the lament, the judgment, the prophecy. It's all one piece. So after he exhorts them to be ready, 
Then Matthew describes, well, through Jesus, the judgment scene, chapter 25. The climax of the discourse is the judgment scene at the end of the world. Uh, those found to be righteous have obeyed the commands to love God. They refer to Him as Lord and they love God by loving their neighbor, and those condemned have the same judgment and are condemned because they did not love their neighbor. The punishment and the reward is eternal in nature. So it's a bit long to explain, but it's not complicated to understand, okay? First section talks about where they are now to the end of the world, the cycle. Second time he talks about 70 AD in the destruction of Jerusalem, and he gives them the warning sign so they can be ready. It's going to happen in their lifetime. Third section, he talks about the end of the world, and he says the opposite. There won't be any signs. You won't be able to tell. So all you have to do is be, be ready. Okay, so that's the big long passage, chapter 23 to chapter 25 in the fifth discourse.